G'day, episode 99, Shrek solo once again, I am still missing my right hand man, Turbo, he hasn't been with me for 8 or 9 episodes, I, I, seriously I have missed the big fella, um, his presence on the show has been sorely missed and uh, I hope he's going to rejoin us sooner or later, but um Episode 99, thank you guys for joining us this far. It's It's been a hectic journey. We've, we've been doing this thing four years, over 300,000 downloads, and wherever you listen to the show and, and leave reviews, you know, we, we love reading them. And today's episode, I'm going to read out one great review that's just come up new. But uh, before we get there, today's episode, Tim Caverman. Now, this bloke's only been sparing a year, so you think, what am I doing getting him on the show? This episode is standout. It's absolutely excellent. Tim goes deep into some absolutely paralyzing issues that I'm sure many of you have experienced and all of us have experienced at some stage. We're going to talk about anxiety and like getting up in your headspace and working through some of the things that uh, can cause you not to have a good time. And, um, you know, this is this this one parallels. It's not just spearfishing. This one's applicable in all areas of your life. It's an absolute phenomenal chat. Thoroughly loved having Tim on the show. I'm really looking forward to getting into this episode in just a couple of seconds with you. Before then, like I said, we had a review on iTunes by Casignon One from the USA. He's uh, he or she says. Anyway, I couldn't get it from the name. I would like to thank these two guys for creating this series. There are very few, if any, freediving spiros where I'm at. I started freediving and spearfishing over a year ago, but just recently found the podcast. My wife has joined me in this new world, and thanks to this series, we have grown so much. Before listening to the series, I was focused on depth and getting better faster. I've since slowed down and stopped focusing on depth and started focusing on hunting. Spearing has become tons more enjoyable since that. Since I started listening to this podcast, I've been able to find a few other people in this area interested in spearing, and my wife and I hope to start a club for this area if we can find a few more people. All of this is thanks to this podcast series. Thank you, guys, and I hope you keep it up. That's phenomenal. That's exactly why we do the show. This is exactly why Turbo and I started the new Spiro. For people like that, for people like you, you just want to get better at spearfishing, improve your stoke, learn a couple of tricks, and have a few laughs. That's exactly why we do this show. Cracker of you. Absolutely loved it. They're always appreciated. Um, guys, just rehash. Uh, North Florida Shootout, May the 1st to the 5th. Uh, it's a huge tournament. I'd encourage you to check out the details at northflshootout.com. And the tournament runs over four or five days. We've, we've put in a few prizes for this and uh, got on board with uh, the dive source there with Ryan Rush. Great man. And uh, I think this is going to be an exciting tournament. There's, uh, there's some fantastic fish weighed last year, and I'm, I'm sure they're expecting the same again this year. Now, talking about clubs before... We have got a page on noobspero.com called Spearfishing Club Connections. If your club is not on there, I would love to list it. You can email the details through shrek at noobspero.com. Just go to um, noobspero.com forward slash spearfishing club connections. It's on our, on our homepage. If you go up there to the right, you'll find it in the menu. Uh, and just see what details I need there to list. But today's featured club... Straight out of California, the NorCal Underwater Hunters, they're up in the north coast of California. They are, are a diving forum dedicated to the northern coast of California. Some great guys on there, and we've had a couple of their guests, including President Matt Madison. Uh, I'd encourage you to go back. He was a passionate abalone fisherman before it all shut down up there. But, um, yep, that's our feature club for the day. So NorCal Underwater Hunters, like I said, if your club's not on here, email me, Shrek at New Spira. I'll get it right on there. But, hey, I really want to get into this episode. Let's do it with Tim Caverman, episode 99. Boom! Today's Dynamite Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. That's right, the fine folks over at Adreno have been supporting the Noob Spiro podcast since about episode 18, and they help pay the bills around here. Just want to encourage you to check out spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro. You can save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200 but it's just a great online shopping experience. The reviews are phenomenal. If you want to check out a new spear gun, new pair of booties, new pair of gloves, someone's used them before, they've written a review, it's on their website, it's all there right for, there for you. Head along to spearfishing.com.au and thank you for shopping with it. Today's major sponsor, Adreno. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Patreon. It's a membership platform that makes it easy for artists and creators like the Noob Spiro to get paid. Basically, you support us per episode at any level that you choose. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Today's episode powered by patron listeners just like you. G'day guys, welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. Today I'm joined by Tim Caverman. And he comes highly recommended by Blair Herbert, and he's got a very interesting perspective to share with me today. It's uh, awesome you could join me. Tim, what time of the day is it over there, mate? Uh, it is 9.30 in the morning here. Um, I'm what? usually sort of quite into the work day by now, so this is a nice change. <laughs> <laughs> 6.30, and I'm, I'm normally the same, actually, but they've got me on late starts this week, so it's bloody good. So I get to, I get to talk spearfishing this morning instead, so awesome. Yeah. Well, it's always a good start to the day. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, tell us a little bit about yourself, Tim. Uh, where do you live and where do you go diving? Uh, I live in Auckland in New Zealand um, on the North Shore, which is quite handy, actually. We're quite lucky here. We've got the Hauraki Gulf on our doorstep. Um, so I go diving. Generally, I'll go north uh, between an hour and two hours drive and um, get in the water there or launch the boat there. I'm quite lucky to have a few friends with boats and houses up that way. Yep. So the majority of the diving is done out of sort of Omaha, Mangawai, and those areas up north because out sort of northeast from there, about an hour in the boat, there's some pretty good islands to go and visit and dive at. Okay, cool. And what sort of fish are you guys targeting out there? Um, for myself, it's pretty much anything and everything at the moment. I'm still very uh-huh. much learning. Um, I'm still, I've am still. i only been doing it, well, it's coming up on a, about a year um, yep. since I did my very first dive, but... Generally, everything from sort of kingfish, snapper, um, John Dory's, Trevally's, Kawai. Uh, there's some boarfish around at the moment. Um, mm. It's I've I've sort of I had quite a late start, and it actually took me about four or five months to shoot anything I'd probably want to talk about. <laughs> 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 and it, it's um, it's slowly progressing, and it's getting up there. And I've got a few you know kingfish under my belt now. I've, shot one snapper um oh, and nice. then the the, the, the trevally and that that in the big schools are a bit easier to get but it's 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 all a learning curve and i'm really enjoying it yeah 100 percent, man you've got a real interesting um perspective and take on things that really wanted to share today i don't think it's too uncommon to to two sparrows either and we'll get into that a little bit further on but tell us maybe about um some of your first spearfishing and freediving experiences um Actually, my first free diving experience, I went out to the Poor Knights with my friend William, um, and that was obviously it's a marine reserve, so we didn't shoot anything. But it was my first experience diving in, I guess, sort of a more exposed environment in deeper water with a lot of fish around. Yeah, yeah. But before that, I'd done a bit of snorkeling when I was younger, but I'd actually avoided water for a very long time due to a couple of uh, near drowning incidents when I was younger oh, and stupider. Um, but that had sort of kept me away from the water and I, I also wasn't a huge fan of boats. Um, so the poor nights was a real eye opener for me and I was pretty much, I bought all my dive gear. So I took everything out by my gun and I was pretty much hooked after that. Oh, yeah. And so sh- shortly after you, you started sparing. Yeah. So uh, I'd say probably a few weeks after that, um, there's probably two notable early spearfishing trips for me. The first one was a bit of a failure to launch, I'd say. I went to uh, a bay up north called Matheson Bay, which is quite a popular local spot, I think, for new divers. It's quite safe and calm and sheltered. Okay. And it's just not it's just not very fishy. But um, <laughs> it, it's a nice it's a nice little bay which is really popular with families and swimmers and that in summer. But a couple hundred meters offshore there's a island and out beyond that a little bit more there's quite a nice weed line and a lot of structure and a lot of ledges and things like that so it's, it's the perfect place to sort of go and learn okay. um, and I went up there and did my first swim out to the island first sort of time in all my gear with my gun and got out there and thought yep this is good um, so far so good and saw a fish and thought yep that's a decent size looks like a cool fish I'll have a crack at that and I swam down it didn't move it sort of just sat and I thought oh, this seems quite easy so I shot it um, and in my excitement of shooting it and coming back up, which was only from about four four meters, I yeah. ended up tangled in my float line, which ripped my snorkel out of my mouth and actually off my mask, and that was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost the fish. Oh. Ended up 
and ended up swimming, sort of having a semi-panic attack, swimming back to shore against the current, which I'd never done before, hugging my float on my back. <laughs> oh, wow. I ended up back on the beach, and the other guy I was diving with, he was still out there, so I just sat on the beach and watched him until he came back, and I sort of called that quits and uh, called that a day, and we went home. <laughs> but it, it, it was quite a good um, experience, actually, because I sort of thought, well, it can't get any worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then a couple of weeks later, I had another crack with my friend Hayden. We went to Tea Point, which is actually just around the corner from Matheson Bay. Um, and you just jump in at a wharf there and swim sort of 20 minutes around the coastline, and there's some really good spots. And on a good day, uh, it can produce some really good fish. And okay. we went out, spent probably three or four hours in the water an afternoon, and um, I came out completely empty-handed, but I still had all my gear this time. Um, and Hayden had cleaned up and shot a John Dory, a boarfish, and a kingfish. Oh, and wow. I remember getting back to the car and loading them into the chili bin and just thinking, I want to do that. Like, that was it. That was 100% seal the deal. That was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> so uh, after that, that was pretty much the first two dives. And from then, it's for the last year, it's been whenever the weather's good or the weekends or whenever there's the opportunity, I just go. Um, mm -hmm. even occasionally on my own if I have to, but it's it's become very much a passion. So did you learn any sort of early lessons from those first sort of two good sessions or, well, one good session where you didn't catch anything and the other session where you swam in with your tail between your legs? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say the biggest lesson, and it's one I'm still learning, is to just slow down. Um, yeah. I was I was full bore, full noise, like chase the fish down, just shoot at everything, and it it really hinders <laughs> spearfishing in general. It hinders you know how you feel, uh, what you get, how you feel at the end of the day, um, and how the fish react to you in the water as well. It's it's it, of yes, slow down would be my biggest sort of lesson from those first few months of diving, um, yeah. and it's. It's something I'm still learning now, just sort of control the excitement, control the, well, for me, anxiety, which we'll get to. But um, it's it's all about taking your time and um, realising that the first swim, fish that swims past isn't going to be the only one um, in most yeah. cases. And just, just really... Uh, taking the time to think about what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, 100%. It's, a, it's actually a lesson I think guys learn over and over and over again. I, I still catch myself not slowing down. And uh, when you get that into that, it's such a weird sport. You, you know, you can be anxious and, and nervous and that makes you speed up. Or you can be super excited, like especially if you haven't got out for a while. And then, you know, even when you've been doing it a few years, you're still guilty of like – you know, going too fast, and um, you know, you know, not spending enough time on the surface sometimes, but definitely your your, your body language and stuff like that beneath the water. So, all right, so you had these two, these two, we'll, we'll call it one dud dive and one good dive, but you didn't catch anything. Moving moving forward from there, um, uh, what fish? When when did you start having some success, and what did that look like? Uh, I would say it took me a good. I kind of became the butt of the joke that I, I just couldn't shoot anything. <laughs> I spent <laughs> so much time in the water, and I shot a lot of, like, uh, I guess you'd call them miscellaneous fish. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it, it took me a long time to really get in the water and calm down and put some effort into actually getting something. And I, I, I went out to the Mokahino Islands, which is, again, northeast, sort of a couple of hours drive north and then straight out um, about an hour and a half on the boat. And I I spent the day there, and that was the first time I'd really swum in a very besides the poor nights. It was the first time I'd been spearfishing anywhere that was sort of just a shore dive, which was comfortable. Okay. And it was in the middle of winter, but it was a really really nice day. There was no wind, um, and again I went out with Hayden and my other friend William, and I thought, right, today's the day I'm going to get something decent. And I've to preface this a little bit, which again I'll get to soon, I'd, I've spent most of my sort of adult life battling with, uh, I guess, a generalised anxiety, um, okay. and it hadn't really affected me in my spearfishing yet until this day. And I think it was just um, a couple of weeks of excitement building up and planning, and it, it all just got too much. And I remember just really struggling the whole day with. 
um, panic and a feeling of nausea, which is sort of a physical reaction. And then really just getting down, really negative internal conversations saying that, you know, it's, today's not the day, it's ruined, like all, all the stuff. But um, we we anchored at one spot, which is quite notorious for being fishy and there's always some good fish in there. Um, and I've, I've actually got it on video and I was swimming back to the boat to basically sit down and just what I assumed was going to fall apart because I'd just been struggling and um, a school of kingfish swam past and I stopped and I thought, right, I'll, I'll have a crack at this. And I stopped and I swam down and rather than chasing them, I just, from, from what I'd learned from Hayden and Blair and that, swam down to their level and chilled out, didn't really take too much notice of it. And then when I turned to it, it was actually swimming straight towards me. Um, oh, wow. And I, I shot it, and it was a good shot. It, it actually really hurt it. It didn't put out much of a fight. But I remember pulling it up, um, doing everything I'd been told to do. I, you know, dispatched it, dragged it over to the boat, put it on the boat, sat down on the boat, and was just like, oh, it's still an experience I probably don't know if I'll match because it had been sort of six months building up to it, and finally I'd done it. And it, it was by no <laughs> means like a trophy fish. It was about 12 kg, I think. But for me at yeah. the time, that was like just the most amazing thing I'd ever done. Yeah, awesome. And that that was a real game changer for me. After that, I think I got the confidence to sort of say, yep, I can do this. And then I just started shooting fish, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, decent fish. Um, and, you know, the freezer slowly filled up and I, I started really enjoying it. Um, and <laughs> that, that day sort of definitely turned the tide for me. That's awesome, man. Like, um, you know, it's awesome that the opportunity sort of arrived for you as well. Like, I bet you your mates were stoked for you on the day as well. Yeah, they were. I remember actually, I, I, I was swimming back to the boat, and I was, I was sort of because I, was, I, I, I'd had such bad anxiety all day. I was sort of in the midst of a bit of a panic attack, and I was yelling at Hayden. I was like, "I got one! I got one!" And he was on the boat filming me with his phone, sort of saying, "Well, pull it up, kill it! Like, come on, deal with it!" And I swam over, and he was filming me. He's like, "You're right." I was like, "No, I'm having a panic attack," but I sort of, I was holding this fish, you know, and I had it up, and it was dead, and it was mine, and I wasn't going to lose it. Um, <laughs> And I just remember there was a couple of big high fives and, you know, then for the rest of the day, it was just, it was sort of getting towards the end of the day, I think, but the rest of the day, I was just like, I couldn't stay out of the water and had a couple of beers and went home and it, it was a absolutely brilliant day for me in the end, which what started out as a really hard day. Yeah, yeah. Ah, awesome, man. That's that's wicked. Look, let's take it practical for a sec. Um, what kind of um, equipment did you start out with? Were you were you sport? Did you get good gear straight out, or what was what was the story? <laughs> Much to the dismay of my accountant, I'm quite a gear geek, and I've got quite expensive taste. So <laughs> I did what I usually do when I take up a new hobby and went out and bought probably more high-end gear. I, actually, in saying that, it wasn't... I went, I went down to a local shop, Splash, here, um, yeah. and they sorted me out with a full Rob Allen kit, basically, um, which was... Uh, it was actually some SEAC plastic fins and then the Rob Allen wetsuit um, and all the rest of the neoprene bits and a Rob Allen gun um, and then uh, I think it was a Rob Allen mask, and that was brilliant. It lasted me... A couple of months until I realised actually that my fins were too small because I couldn't figure out why I couldn't walk every time I went diving <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so what, you just had small foot pockets? Yeah, I've got quite wide feet and they fitted me in length, but they were compressing my feet sort of sideways. Okay. Yeah. But there was a couple of times, especially on the long shore dives, I'd sort of have to crawl up the beach back to my ute. Oh, wow. I, I dealt with them for a while, and then I thought, oh, I'll, I'll upgrade the fins, so I got some um, dive R fins. Okay. What what um what for what foot pockets did you have on the Rob Allen's? Has he got his own foot pocket? No, sorry, the fins were SEAC fins. Um, they okay. were just they were just sort of the entry level ones, and I think the foot pockets were just the ones that come with those fins. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I went and tried on a whole heap of different foot pockets to find some wider ones and discovered that Omar, or Omer, yep. O-M-E-R, however you pronounce it, they made some really nice wide ones. Yep. So they're the ones I've stuck with. Um, up until a few months ago, I got myself some Black Tech carbon fins, and okay. they, don't, they don't actually suit those foot pockets, so I found some Pathos foot pockets 
I think it's like the largest ones they do, but they fit me. They're probably the best fitting one I've found so far for my wide feet. <laughs> okay, well, that's cool. I've had the Pathos foot pockets have got a narrow instep on them. So it's interesting that, that they're working well with, for you with a, with a wide foot. So that's cool. Yeah. All right, cool. And uh, you, how'd you go with suits? You had the you had the RA suit starting off? Yep, yep. So, I, again, I've been through quite a bit of gear finding what I really like, and I think that's something, some advice I'd give new divers now is to, there's lots of packages out there, and a lot of them are really good, but if you're, like, I've got quite broad shoulders, and I found the Rob Allen suit's too tight in the shoulders. I've heard that from other people as well, and the suit's brilliant. I've still got it, and I still wear it, but I, I invested in a Beauchard suit, uh, which is just next level. Like it, It's obviously, it was four times the price of the Rob Allen one, but it's it's an amazing wetsuit, and I've worn it every time I've been diving, up until recently, just because it was a bit hot. I've gone down to a three mil suit. Yeah, that wetsuit for me was sort of like wearing silk after wearing, I don't know, so, oh, I don't even know how to explain it, but it was for me, for me and my comfort levels, it, it was a lot nicer. But in saying that, all my friends dive in Rob Allen suits and they say the same things about those. So it's, I think it's quite a personal thing. So after one year, it sounds like you've been for a fair bit of gear. What about guns? Uh, <laughs> I'll probably get shit from a lot of my friends because I've bought a lot of them now. Um, yeah. I, I've got two Rob Allen guns, just two 120s, um, which I absolutely love. They're both. Yeah sort of my go-to gun and all the guys I dive with use them. I've got one with a reel on it and one without. Um, yeah. I have a Bosha carbon reel gun as well, which is a nice short one, which I got okay. for uh, sort of because I really want to get into snooping for snapper and learning about the actual hunting around the rocks and not using a float so much. And that's why I got that. And that's, I haven't had too much use with it yet because it's quite new, but that's a really, really nice gun as well. Um, okay, and then to top it all off, I bought a mini sub roller gun. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get single roller? Yeah, just a single roller. Um, yeah. And then I put a bigger rubber on it. And um, that was actually the gun I shot that first kingfish with out at the Moak. Okay. So I bought that gun before I'd ever shot even a, like a car wire, I think. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I think the first fish I shot with it was a butterfish, and it was probably a bit, you know, shooting a, a rabbit with a big caliber rifle. <laughs> I can't believe you upgraded the rubber on it. Those things punch like a like a donkey through everything. I mean, I mean, there's no recoil, but like, um, man, they go through everything. Those things. So yeah, well, that that first kingfish, I remember after we filleted it, we sort of realised that it had actually broken its spine, and that's why it didn't really put up any fight. Um, yeah. And it's, it's slightly more fiddly to work with in the water. Like There's a bit more to it when you're reloading it and doing the double wrap and things like that. But it's, I've, I've sort of held on to it. I'm, I'm thinking about parting with it actually to part, pay for some photography gear, but it's, it's a brilliant gun. I think if I ever went to the tropics or anything like that, it would be quite good there. Mm, mm. Yep, yep, 100%. Yeah, cool. Hey, all right, let's move on. Um, sounds like you had some good mates starting out and uh, – and obviously, they, they've given you a lot of tips and pointers along the way. I mean, um, what other mentors have you had? Oh, I wouldn't say I had a mentor as such. It's, it's, I guess my close circle of friends that I go diving with have been really patient with me. And if we've got a joint conversation on Facebook, me, Hayden, and Blair, and if you were to, you know, you could print that conversation and probably make a book on <laughs> Special Edition 101 because it's, you know, it's just from me. It's question after question after question, and they've they've taken the time to answer all of them, um, and they've included me in their boat trips and that. So that's really been sort of the thing that has probably kept me doing it um, yeah. safely and competently. And then um, I know you've interviewed before Luke Potts. I yeah. watched I watched all his videos, and I've actually met him a couple of times, and he again answered questions for me and his breathing technique was actually the one that after about eight months I finally have settled on using his technique and that really helps me um, relax and it's just taken my diving to the next level and it took me a long time to get the breathing figured out so his his rate yourself yeah rate the your... rate yourself relaxation it's yeah I won't you know I won't give away his IP but it's 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 a technique that was kind of the opposite to what I had been doing. Um, yeah. And and 
again, I think it's whatever works for you, but that's sort of been a game changer for me in the last few months of actually getting some decent time on the bottom and getting to finally some decent depth. Yeah. Oh, well, guys guys can actually check that out on Vimeo. It's uh, at how to, how to Spearfish on Vimeo. And uh, I think... There's a there's a Noob Sparrow discount code on there as well. So, but yeah, I, I found uh, Luke's got that whole video on on breathing techniques, and I, like I watched it, and and I just thought, wow, he's done a really good job of just putting this together so it's relevant for Sparrows because a lot of the freediving stuff's like very technical and stuff, and he doesn't really geek out too much on all the technical stuff, which you can do. He just makes a real practical guide for uh, for and and you do and you get some instant improvements out of that. I think so. That's cool. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's it's I had for the first six months been doing all this quite intense sort of altering my breathing, which I'd seen in free diving videos, and it just for me personally it didn't work. Um, yeah, but, but just getting back to the mentors that. It, you know, it's friends, it's people like Luke, and then it's just the whole online community. Like the New Zealand Spiro Facebook group is just uh, amazing. Everyone yeah. is super cool. And the, the Bluefin Spearfishing Club here in Auckland, everyone's just towards newbies, is they're all really quite open and helpful. Yeah, you guys are sport. You've got uh, Spearfishing Fundamentals next door as well. I've had Rob on the show. And uh, yeah, yeah, Rob actually, I did a rescue course with Rob in the pool, um, which. Yeah. It is actually something I should mention, especially for new divers. That gave me the confidence to really look after my mates in the water as well and know yeah. how to spot them. And his training, um, I, I did the pool session, which was the rescue part of it, was just you know invaluable. And he does ongoing training in the lake and stuff like that, which I plan to do at some stage as well. Yeah, awesome, man. Yeah, the, the rescue stuff's excellent. Even though when you're confident in the water, you think you know what you're doing. Man, just just doing a few solid drills and stuff like that, it's excellent. You can't you can't beat it. And when you've done it, you just think, jeepers, everyone needs to do this. But you try and tell people, and they're just like, yeah, whatever. But man, it's a, it's. It goes back to that excitement of just wanting to get in the water and shoot fish. But yeah, yeah. when you when you start diving below sort of well, I guess for me, once I started going past sort of twelve or thirteen meters, and mm. was with friends going quite a bit deeper. I personally wanted to know what to do if something went wrong with one of them. Um, yeah. it, it, it's just a bit, and for them, it's probably a confidence thing as well, especially because they do. And I watch them, and they spot each other so well. It's like, okay, I need to to be a good dive buddy. I think it's just something you need to learn. Mm, cool. Hey, I'll link up um, Luke Potts stuff and Rob Harrison Spearfishing Fundamentals and and the NZ Spiro Group. Yeah, sport for resources there. Bloody hell. Um, the the NZ Spiro page on on Facebook. Cheap as that's a good group. Um, I, I was impressed when I, I I don't think I got on till there was maybe five or six thousand people on there already but it, it sort of retained all of the cool stuff that you get with smaller groups like um you know where people actually want to help each other and there's there's a little bit of trolling but not too much and uh generally yeah there's, there's look there's always going to be people that are negative or they've had a bad day and they just want to wind someone up and that you know that they can do that but it's yeah. uh, overall it's just a really open and welcoming community um yeah, I've, I've done a bit of shooting and that some of the shooting forums, you know, there's a big contrast where the veterans just don't want a bar of helping newbies as much, um, and the spearfishing one's quite different in my experience. Yeah, hundred percent. I like it. Uh, they've, done, they've done well with that, the boys. Guys, head over to Vimeo.com. Check out the How to Spearfish video series by Luke Potts. There's nearly four hours of video training there, and they're divided into five different videos so far to help you take on the areas of difficulty that you might have. Now, there's a beginner's guide to spearfishing gear. There's a guide to how to increase your breath hold for spearfishing. There's techniques for spearfishing yellowtail kingfish, which also doubles as a guide to hunting pelagic fish. There's a, a guide techniques for spearfishing snap which is a really good um, helpful guide for approaching canny reef fish which is a tough one and finally a guide to spearfishing around sharks if you want to buy any of these videos use the code noob Spiro and save a bit of cash check it out Vimeo on demand how to spearfish Let's move on to some obstacles starting out because you had a few. You've already talked a little bit about anxiety, and we're going to dig into that a bit more in Veterans Vault. But um, what were some of the other obstacles um, you had, and, and how did you overcome them? 
Um, <laughs> the biggest one for me actually was seasickness. And it's funny because one of the early podcasts I listened to of yours, you did a whole <laughs> one about seasickness. Um, and I remember taking away quite a few tips from that, um, oh, cool. which still help me now. But it, a, a long time ago, I got extremely sick on a charter fishing boat. And okay. ever since that day, I've just avoided boats like the plague. I just will not go near them. Um, and so for me to get on a boat took a lot. I, I actually had some friends just take me out and drive around one day just to see if I got sick. Um, <laughs> so it's, it, that, that was a huge thing that I had to overcome, and I, I used myself as a bit of a experiment and tried a whole lot of different medications and um, foods and approaches to the day to see what would help. And it's, I take a... Um, uh, antihistamine called cyclozine now it's just it for me personally it completely rids my day of seasickness i just <clears throat> will not get sick um oh excellent because some some of them have got there's a few medical warnings with different ones but um yeah it's sort of like dialing in on the one that's good for you was was there any side effects from them no it's look this is a hundred percent something you need to talk to your doctor about um i'm not saying like the one i take is just an over-the-counter antihistamine um, yeah. there's about five of them in the family of antihistamines that do similar things within your body, uh, mm. but most of them are quite sedating, so they'll make you really drowsy, which isn't ideal when you're freediving. Um, mm. the, the one I take for me personally doesn't make me tired. It does make some people tired, so it's a matter of uh, talking to your doctor, I think, explaining you know, if you do have that issue, what causes it, but the, the sort of science is that it blocks the signals to your brain that A, make you want to throw up and B, make you experience sort of motion. Okay. So it, it does work pretty well in my case, but I've tried heaps that didn't do anything that for other people work well as well. So it's just a matter of testing them out. I never understood the mechanism, the physiological mechanism, because I was thinking, right, you're using antihistamines because histamines are an immune response. And so it's really interesting to learn that you know, it, it's somehow interfering with the signals, and that's what's giving you nausea and all the rest of it. So, even I'm learning stuff today, Tim. This <laughs> I, I, again, I might be a bit far off the mark, but it's um, it's it, from what I read, it's it's about blocking the histamine response and the signals that actually go to your brain, which cause those physical responses of sickness. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. That was one of the big battles, um, and then. The only other battles really for me was just overcoming a, a quite deeply ingrained anxiety issue, which <laughs> affects me in all parts of my life, but especially yeah. when I go out of my comfort zone. But we can talk about that in the, the, the Veterans Vault part. Yeah, awesome. Love it. Um, yeah, I'll be really keen to dial in on this a little bit. Um, um, what about your best day? What about your best day out spearfishing so far? You've uh, you're spoiled up there in Auckland, so I'm, I'm betting you've had a few good days. Um, I've had... Two really notable days that uh, really made me feel like I've come along in the sport. Um, it, neither of them were actually in Auckland. They were both in the Coromandel over Christmas, the one just been. Uh, okay. I stayed down there. With, there was about three houses of us, big group of friends. And um, then I had Hayden and Blair were staying across the water at Cook's Beach, and they came down later. But the start of the holiday was actually me and all my friends, and none of them are interested in spearfishing. There's a few that like fishing um, and boating, but none of them have any interest in spearfishing. Okay. So we were staying in Fidiang, and I'd been talking up, I'll go out and shoot a kingfish to give us all dinner. We'll make a big raw fish salad. Yeah, yeah. I'd been, I'd been talking to them about this for months before the holiday, and <laughs> we went. And obviously I got there, and I had no none of my friends that are into it to help me. or I had friends with boats, and they were like, right, where are we going? And I had no idea. <laughs> So I picked an island out of Fidianga, which I could see from the beach, and just thought, oh, that looks all right. And um, we went out there. I think it's called Centre Island from memory. But we shot out there on a ho horrendous day. It was really windy. It was pissing down with rain. It was choppy. Um, <laughs> we were in a, an older Haines Hunter, sort of almost like a ski boat. And yeah. uh, we, we went out there, and all I remember is my friend's wife just saying, make it quick, when I got in the water, because <laughs> the <laughs> was just it wasn't pleasant for the people on the boat and I thought shit there's I'm under a lot of pressure here and I found this I, you know I took what I learned and I found the, the side of some structure and a whole lot of current and I jumped in and thought right 
there's got to be something in here, and there's nothing. And I swam around the corner and found some bait fish and thought, okay, I'll hang out here for a bit. And an hour later, I looked over at the boat, and they're all sort of staring at me, like, looking quite sick, thinking, hurry up, can we leave? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll do I'll do two more dives, and then we're out. And I did the first one, nothing. Did the second one, and I was sitting on the bottom, um, and there was lots of bait fish around, and I sat there patiently, and finally a kingfish swam past, and I shot it, dragged it to the boat, took it in, filleted it, and made a big salad for everyone. <laughs> and <laughs> half my friends were like, okay, we didn't actually think we were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That was that was pretty cool for me because it was the first time I'd done it sort of on my own without someone saying, oh, there's probably a good fishy spot here. Yeah. And then two days later, I went out to Cuvia Island, which is um, about an hour and a half northeast out of Fidianga, out past the Great Mercury Islands. And that's quite an exposed, uh, smaller island compared to what I'm used to. And okay. out there was the first time I dived in really open. We sort of stopped in some big workups out off the island where there was some big like launches fishing. And I jumped in the water there and it was the first time I'd seen really, really big schools of like big fish, um, yeah. big kingfish. I thought, okay, this is sort of next level. And we spent a lot of time out there swimming on the island and out in the workups. And my, my whole goal for that day was I really wanted a, you know, a decent kingfish, like sort of 20 kg or over. Um, yeah. So I, I left them alone all day in the schools. They weren't didn't look big enough, and I'd shot one a couple of days before, so I didn't want just another small one. Um, and we anchored at once. Well, actually, we didn't anchor. We came round the, the end of the island to one spot where I think in the fish finder we just saw it looked really good, and Hayden said, get in here. And I got in, and the first fish I saw was this monster kingfish swimming towards me. And I reached out to shoot it, and an even bigger one came up behind it. So I shot that. Um, it again, it injured it. It pretty much died. But it's the first time I've seen my float just go straight underwater. Um, yeah. And I pulled it up, and we got it on the boat, and I weighed it. And the bloody thing was only, it was 16 kg, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> for me, that was a big fish, and that 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 was I was pretty stoked that day. And just getting out there into that sort of environment was quite a big thing for me. So. Those are probably my two best days diving so far, I'd say. Yeah, awesome, man. Now, 16 kg, 35 pounds. That's a respectable kingy. They, if you don't put the shot in a good spot, they'll they'll tow you around for a good five, six minutes. Um, well, well, when the float went past me, I grabbed it and it sort of pulled me a bit. And I just remember yelling to Hayden, get in the water because <laughs> I'm going to need yeah. some help here. And by the time he got in the water, it actually died and I was pulling it up. <laughs> um, but it, I can imagine something like that if you didn't injure it or even the bigger ones that the guys shoot like the 30 kg ones you'd have a bit on your hands if you didn't hurt it <laughs> hmm. so with these kingies you're shooting um what's your sort of shot placement like with them um i from what i've been taught i've been i sort of aim for the lateral line above the fins on the side and that's like a really good holding shot um yep. and the few the you know the ones i've landed that's generally where i've shot them um i've shot I think two in the head and I've yeah. actually lost, I lost both of them off the spear. They just sort of thrashed until they came off. And yeah. that, that was sort of a learning curve for me to stop doing that because I, obviously I don't want to injure a whole lot of fish and just leave them, you know, not land them and utilize them. Um, I, if I shoot a fish, I really want to land it. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of decided until I'm really good enough to place a good head shot and just, you know, turn its lights out, I, I'll stop aiming there. Um, yeah, yeah. So those, those definitely those shots in the meaty part behind the gill plate is where I've had the best luck and where I've always been taught to aim. Um, mm, cool. it, obviously, it doesn't always go with your aim, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say, like sometimes with the kingies, like you get the school and then you might maybe you'll get a couple that turn towards you, and then they'll, they'll almost be swimming quarter on towards you and you've got an opportunity there to shoot them in the head which is why you probably did do that but then sometimes they'll they'll pull up alongside and then they'll quarter away again and head off what 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 when do you when do you now that you're a bit more experienced when do you sort of choose that moment to to shoot so the difference between when i started and now is when i started i would have shot it regardless of how it was in the water or what it was doing or how far away it was i would have just shot at it um, and a lot of times like they were way out of range and my spear didn't even reach it. But now I've learned to just um, take my time. I wait until it's sitting in a good position where I know it's in range, I know it's going to do the damage, and I know it will. 
um, mm. it, you know, it's going to hurt it. But there, there's still the occasion where, like you say, you'll find one that actually swims straight towards you. Uh, and I shot one at the moats last Tuesday, actually, that was swimming straight towards me. I thought, right, I'm going to put this right between its eyes. And just as I pulled the trigger, it turned and it got it. And it went sort of, uh, I guess, from the head and came out the bottom. And I kept yeah. it, it lifted it, and it really hurt it. But that if it if it had turned before I pulled the trigger, I probably wouldn't have shot at it. I, I would have waited because there were so many of them. There was no need to just you know take a pot shot at that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, that just yeah. goes back to taking your time. Like now, I'll I'll actually ignore them as I'm swimming down and wait until I'm ready to shoot before I actually engage one and turn towards one. And that makes quite a big difference to how they act in the water. Yeah, yeah. What about hunting fish underneath a school of kingies? Like one of the tactics I like to use here is, you know, you find a school of um, drummer or surgeon fish and you can lay out, lay out underneath them and the school goes quiet and then it's like a signal for other species that you, you really want. They'll, they'll start coming in. So sometimes, I mean, you might have already shot a kingie for the day so you're done, but there's still a couple of huge schools around. Is it good hunting out underneath them? Yeah, I'm... I still struggle with that a bit because swimming in the workups for me gets me, well, I get really worked up and, you know, I can't, I really struggle to do a decent breathe up. <laughs> and yeah, 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 yeah. I, I completely understand. All, all the ones I've swum in here have been quite hectic, so they're moving really fast. So I'm, I'm pretty much finning as, as fast as I can to keep up with them. And eventually they'll stop and sort of circle around you. And by that stage, I'll, if I try and do a breathe up, it will take me 10 minutes before I can actually dive. So yeah. in those situations, I've never sort of got under them to have that experience. But I've got a few good like Trevallis and Carway out of schools. And it's more like just aim and shoot and you're going to hit something. But yeah. um, I, I, I've seen more like in the schools, the kingfish sitting under them. And if you actually dive down through the school and chill out a bit, the kingfish are there. Um, yeah. And but But it's, if there's already kingfish on the boat, like it, it, I'd probably shoot a trevally or something like that, just as a, a different something different. Yeah, cool, cool. Hey, all right, we're already talking about hunting and species, so let's get on to your favourite species to hunt and uh, the techniques you use to get them successfully. The the most fun I've actually had was the couple of times I've really gone across some good coastline looking for snapper, and okay. it's it's something I'm really poor at. I've shot one snapper in my whole spear fishing career, and it was. I think 36 centimetres, so it wasn't, it's nothing I'd sort of gloat about, but that, yeah. um, I find the kingfish, they're quite, I don't want to say easy because they're not, but they're always there and they're, um, you know, you do a good dive and you can shoot one, but yeah. with the snapper, it's, there's a lot more strategy to it and that took a lot of learning and it's something that, um, like even if I talk to my friends about it, they'll say it took them years to get a decent snapper um, and it's it's something I'm still learning like, you know, cruising along a coastline that might only be two or three metres deep, but how you position yourself in the water where keeping the sun behind you and finding those ledges where the snapper might be sitting, um, depending on the current, which from what I've learned ideally would be coming at you, so you're swimming into yep. the current, um, and then getting a, a decent breathe up to get down to the bottom and up to the ledge in a concealed manner so the fish don't actually know you're there. Whereas okay. I tend to swim right up and dive down on the ledge so they actually see me coming. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. It, it, it's, I really enjoyed that because there's a bit of strategy involved and a bit of, it, it's not a given, well, I, you know, I've spent hours doing it and not seen snapper or I've scared some really big ones off. Um, the, the last time I went to the moats actually with Blair and Hayden, Blair was filming me and I came over a little bommy and there was what I thought was an undersized snapper. So I swam away from it, and I came up and Blair just said, that was a pretty decent fish, man. <laughs> so it's, it, it's, it's all about learning for me. I'm really enjoying the learning of actually a strategy on hunting these things. Um, mm. And it's, it's again, it's all about the pressure point where the current sits against the ledges that you're hunting, um, where they – the time of day where they're a bit more drowsy, which seems to be quite early in the morning. Um and, and then obviously you can set up the ground baits and stuff for them, which I haven't done a whole lot of yet. Okay, cool. You brought up, it made me think of a couple of interesting points. One is, is like when you're hunting out deeper, say, you know, you're in 15 uh, meters or 
50 feet or so, um, you can be a little bit noisier on the surface, I find, because there's that all that water column between you and the bottom where you start hunting or whatever. But when you're in like two or three meters of water, you've got to be super, super quiet. Your duck dive's got to be on point. All your, all your gear's got to be quiet and, you know, like no air pockets. You've got to have, you know, you just got to be a bit more on, on your game from the start. And then I liked your idea of just sort of getting down and creeping forward along the bottom before you look over the ledge. So you're, you're not... Yeah. That was the big one for me. I was aiming for the ledge when I would duck dive, but mm. by the time you, by the time you get to the ledge and peep over it, your, your legs are still flailing around above you. So it's it's actually, you've got to get a decent breath, get down to the level of the ledge, you know, a couple of metres before it, and then creep up to it, from what I'm learning, because that way you're flat against the bottom and the fish are less likely to see, you know, your eyes peek over. But, yeah, the noise things, I, I'm quite noisy in the water, so I sort of flail around a lot and I'm always sort of um, clearing my snorkel or stuff like that. So it's, it's a bit more relaxing and just you've really got to chill out, get your heart rate low and really take your time and just um, move as silently as you can, which can be quite hard when you're swimming against current. Yeah, nice. Nice. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing your success in the future. You've been thinking a lot about it and you've got a pretty clear pr approach there. So I'm sure the fish are only, you know, a couple of months away. And uh, I... It's definitely it's time to leave the kingfish alone and start focusing on getting some decent snappers is my goal moving forward. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And uh, sometimes I think spearfishing's like that. It's like the species by species approach. And, um, you know, so you look at the comp guys and they shoot eight or nine species in a day or, or more. And you just kind of, you, you're dumbfounded that, you know, they've figured out, you know, how to, how to hunt those species successfully all the time. And uh, it's, it's, it's real art. There's a real art to that. <laughs> mm. For sure, for sure. All right, hey, man, let's get into toughest situation and veterans' fault because they're kind of tied together today. We're going to talk a bit about anxiety, I think. So, look, what's one of the um, one of the more or two of the times, that the sort of more memorable times where you've really sort of um, been under the grip of it? Um, I guess for me, and, and, and when I was when we were discussing this earlier and we were mentioning veterans' fault, my immediate thought was I'm not qualified to talk about any sort of hunting or gear or anything like that. But yeah. what what I've what I've become really good at in the last year is overcoming uh, internal struggles, I guess, of spearfishing, and it's it's something, especially as a New Zealander or just a bloke in general, that I think most people find really uh, difficult or even embarrassing to discuss, especially with their mates. You know, like you're out on a boat, it's quite a blokey day out. Um, so for someone like me, and I'm sure, you know, there's probably at least one other person listening to this that anxiety or depression or <clears throat> anything like that, which is, you know, all too common in, in, in our generation, it, it's, it's a really hard thing to go out on a boat and really be struggling internally and, when someone says to you what's wrong to actually you know I, for the first few months I just said I'm seasick <laughs> and I, yeah, know, I, I, I wasn't it, it was that yeah. I was sort of just crippled by anxiety um yeah so for me the the spearfishing I absolutely you know love it's it's a passion I think I'll, I'll never there's nothing that will ever stop me doing it um and, and my anxiety over my lifetime has stopped me doing a lot of things. Um, yeah. And spearfishing is one of the first things where the want to go spearfishing is a lot stronger than the anxiety. There's there's certainly days, and when I first started, I look, I'd get on the boat at the marina and start feeling dizzy and short of breath just because I knew I was on a boat and I could get seasick. Um, I had such a phobia of ever repeating how sick I got all those years ago that I struggled to even the minute the boat was untied, um, it was all on like the, the the chemicals in the brain that caused these horrible, uh, I guess, feelings were just pumping full noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I can only speak from my experiences and what triggers uh, are, are wired within me. But for me, and I think for a lot of people with anxiety, it's it's about control. Like when you feel a loss of control, that's when it kicks in. And I believe personally that anxiety is something that everyone experiences. Um, you know, yeah. even top level athletes, everyone experiences it. It's completely normal. It's healthy. It's it's a reaction that was built into you to tell you that there's a threat. And the problem is with certain people like myself, 
it it boils over to a point where it's past, okay, there's a threat, get on with the day anyway. It's, there's a threat, something really bad's going to happen, get out now. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, it's quite a flight, fight or flight response where if, say, a big one for me my whole life has been crowds. I can't deal with them. So if I'm in a big crowd and I get anxious, I can walk out of it and it goes away. Um, yeah. When you're on a, when you're on a boat two hours out at sea, you don't have that option. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, for people with anxiety, that's what I think they will struggle with in anything, not just spearfishing. When you push your comfort zone and you get yourself in a situation where you can't escape uh, and there's no easy escape route, that's when you're really going to struggle. Mm. So I have learned a lot of tools in the last year to deal with it. Um, okay. I guess a, an example for me would be of an anxious experience spearfishing, which still happens to me now. It happened to me last Tuesday. Um, brilliant day. Had an awesome sleep the night before, confident, full day out. And one of the spots we anchored in was quite rough. And I had a thought, which was, oh, you might get sick here. And then straight, you know, snowball downhill, I got in the water, I couldn't breathe, arms felt heavy. These are all physical responses to anxiety. Um, you, you just feel like a lead weight swimming in the water. So that, that's an example for me and how it affects me. Now, yeah. six months ago, eight months ago, that would have been my day over. Um, I, I would have called it quit, sat on the boat, no, um, done. But in the last year, I've actually learned you can take the power away from it. And if there was one message... I'd really like to communicate um, to anyone with depression or anxiety or anything else. You can, rather than fighting it and saying, oh my God, this horrible thing's happening to me, how do I fix it? I've adjusted my view to, okay, I feel a certain way. Um, it's probably always going to be there. Let's just deal with it and get on with the day anyway. It might be uncomfortable for the next you know, half an hour or whatever. And mm. it, takes the, it takes the power out of what you're experiencing. So now, last Tuesday, I actually just got on the boat. Uh, my friend William said, you're right. And I actually just said, look, I'm, I'm feeling quite anxious. I'm just going to take a breather. And he said, sweet. And he got back in the water. It wasn't a big deal. Um, and it, it passed. And I got on with the day and had a really good day. So it's, it's, for me, two things helped. That was seeing a therapist and actually learning some tools to bat off it. But the biggest thing and the most important uh, I guess story is that just actually just be open about it and if you're struggling tell your mates um, yeah. some, of them might, some of them might understand some of them might know what to say but that's fine they don't, they don't need to it's not their job to just mm. actually saying and actually saying to your mates look I'm, I'm struggling I'm, I'm feeling anxious this is what's happening give me 10 minutes give me half an hour and I'll be back into it with you rather than like what I used to do and lying and saying oh I'm seasick I'm um, God, we need to go in, you know, the day's over, this is horrible. Um, mm. it, our, I think our whole culture and society just needs to actually, in anything, just say, look, I'm battling with this. Um, yeah. I'm going to be all right. I've got, I've got the tools. And you need to decide personally whether you, you suffer at a level where you can deal with it, just talking to your mates, or you need to get talk to a professional, which, you know, I do, um, yeah. and actually just learn some tools right down to how you breathe, which are really going to help you get through the day. Um, mm. And if, you, if there's any, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Oh, it's all gold. I see you made me feel like uh, a little bit guilty. I mean, I, I deal w- with anxiety in, in situations as well, but I was thinking I, I was out a while ago with three guys, and I think all of them felt anxious that it was a bit rough. And uh, I ended up diving by myself, and three of them were my boaties, and I, I just paid out on them nonstop. And I called. I, I, I called, I said, there's three boaties in a Spiro. I even created like a, a private message group with them and I was, I was knocking them. So, so that makes me feel real guilty for being a piece of shit there. And, uh, and, and I was going to say, the, the other thing it makes me think of is like, um, as a bloke, I think our heart is to, always to try and fix stuff. And so when, you, when your mate's suffering with, a, with anything uh, or anyone you care about, you're... you're Kind of my first response, and I think it's typical of a lot of guys, is we, we want to fix stuff. We want to give advice. We want to, and I think if you're in the, and, and I know I've personally had pretty bad anxiety at times. I think when someone's trying to give you advice when you're dealing with heightened levels of anxiety, it doesn't really help. You've got to have, 
your your own internal tools and and trying someone trying to teach you a tool while you're in the grip of anxiety i think a lot of it's counterproductive is that would you agree with that uh, yeah so uh, again everyone's probably different but for me personally if i'm really struggling or uh, again using spearfishing as an example if i've just had a really sort of bad anxious episode and i've jumped on the boat and someone's like what's wrong with you what can i do oh tell me what's happening that makes it a lot worse um and it's it's it that's kind of goes against what I just said about talking to mates about it, but sometimes yeah. it's a matter of actually just the bigger deal you make of it. Because, you know, um, when I first started, I'd make it quite a big deal. I'd be like, guys, I'm really struggling, like something bad's happening. I'm, you know, I can't break. like make it this huge deal. And that blows it up in your own mind. Whereas it's yeah. that's feeding it and giving it power. Whereas now, um, I just literally say, and my friends know, and this is where. You know, I appreciate my friends deeply because they've been patient and they, you know, we, we, I joke about it as well. And it's like, guys, yep, it's happening again. I'm just going to go sit on the boat. And um, even Blair, you know, last time it happened on my out, he's like, oh, should I make some jokes or something? Like, what's going to, you know, help? And I was like, to be honest, I'm just, I'll just sit here for half an hour. And they got back in and they did their diving and I didn't feel resentment or anything. Like, I just, I appreciated the fact that they, they gave me shit about it, but they accepted that that's what was happening, and they got back in the water. And half an hour later, I was back in the water with them, and it was fine. Um, yeah, cool. It's it, it, it's all about just verbalizing it and really communicating it. And I think in any sport or any industry or job or anything, the same thing. If the more you internalize it and actually hide it, it, it makes it a lot worse. It gives it power. Whereas if you just say, "Guys, bloody anxiety or this bloody depression," or um, it's crept up on me again. Um, mm. It, it takes its power away, and then obviously, if it's you know really bad, you you seek professional help, um, and that goes without saying. But it's your friends can play a huge part in in helping with that. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, it, like, if you if you're on the boat with someone and they say, "Look, I'm, I've got I'm dealing with a bit of anxiety. Give me five or whatever," you just sort of just be like, "Yep, just be cool about it. Don't make a big thing about it, and just carry on." Yeah, so cool? it's it's just the, the nicest thing you can hear is. Are you okay? Literally, um, is there any like? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do? Th- those two questions, just to know that they know, because yeah. the biggest thing is, especially for people, again going back to losing control. Like, what if the worst happens? What if what if I do completely lose the plot and have to get back? Well, my friends will understand because they've already asked me if I'm okay, and that takes away that horrible thought. Yeah, nice. nice. It's not about sitting down and having a counselling session, you know, out on yeah. the boat. Just, it's just about saying, hey, mate, like, that's totally fine. Let me know if you need anything and, and just get on and, and all the power's gone. Um, yeah, man. And just, just as a side note, um, bear fishing in general, and I'd imagine anything else that really pushes people outside their comfort zone, in my experience, has been the biggest tool towards, I guess, healing, more so than yeah. medication, uh, more so than therapy. Actually, if I look back on my last year, even I'll scroll through my Instagram, which is mostly spearfishing now, it makes yeah. you feel pride and confidence in yourself for what you can achieve. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then in normal day life, if I'm going to a meeting and I start feeling anxious, it's like, well, hold on. Yesterday I was swimming uh, at the Hen and Chicken Islands filming shark. So I can go <laughs> do this meeting. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 can, I can 100% agree with you. Like, um, and I think like there's a physiological response too in your body when you're freediving as well that, that that is like when you when you when when you can get maybe if you are anxious about it and you get but you get past that and you you have the mammalian dive response kick in you know your heart beats lowering I think there's a real uh, healing part of freediving as well and uh, and spear, spearfishing uses freediving but um, yeah and I've I've talked to uh, a veteran a veteran it's freediving's become popular with quite a few veterans and. Uh, you know they use it to help deal with PTSD and all sorts of stuff. So, no, I 100% hear what you're saying. I actually had this conversation with Luke Potts not so long ago, and he said, "Oh, I reckon people that are having panic attacks should just stick their head in water and like let the mammalian dive reflex kick in and lower their heart rate." And I was like, "It's actually not stupid. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. there's method to that. Um, but bear fishing, especially, it it teaches you have to learn to breathe properly and control your breathing and." I use my breathe up technique in like day to day life now when I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed and it helps. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's been a, a a very huge healing tool for me. So anyone out there that's you know considering spearfishing or is thinking about it but they think 
you know, they're not going to be able to do it, just just do it and do it at your own pace. Start start off diving at a beach or somewhere really safe and trust me, the the benefits of it will come. Yeah, awesome, man. All right, so we've sort of dealt with a little bit of external stuff. Like what are some of the – can you walk us through some of the internal – uh, rubrics or tools you use when you do uh, so I mean you've talked about sort of not fighting it just sort of going with it acknowledging that it's there and then moving forward and using some breathing techniques is, is there any other tools that have been helpful yeah so there's some real specific ones um, which I've learned from I work with a lady called Ampara Bowens who's changed my life she's a, a psychologist and she taught me some really real life tools I can use in the water and a big one for me is because quite often I'll be swimming around coastline on my own or, you know, that happens. Um, that's just the way it works. And I'll start getting quite worked up and I can't do my breathe ups. I can't stay calm. So I'll actually start in my head, like just looking around going fish, rock, weed. And it sounds really stupid, but the minute you start labeling off things you can see and that you can hear and that you can feel, um, it, it takes you out of your head and it removes you from that internal struggle. And you start realizing, okay, there's fish around here. Uh, oh, how cold's the water? Um, how dirty's the water? Uh, you know, how close to the rocks are you? And it just get out. It's, it's just re- it's getting out of your own head, really, which is what yeah. will calm down. Making yourself present in the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, you know, there, there's a saying, "Be where your feet are." Um, yeah. And it's it's all about. I use it, and you know, when I'm in my car, I'll start looking around. Okay, what can I see? What can I hear? What can I feel? And it works so well in the water for calming you down because once you, you know, you can swim for an hour and I've done it before, swim for an hour and realize that for the last hour I haven't even done a dive because I've just been swimming along thinking negative thoughts or having negative internal communications with myself. And it's like, okay, Tim, you're wasting your day. You're out at this beautiful island. What can you see? And so, okay, there's some fish. There's, you know, there's a good ledge. And just like you just said, be present. If yeah. if you if you're swimming along thinking about what happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow or are you going to get sick, it's a waste of a day because it's not going to change what happened yesterday or what happens tomorrow. Um, yeah, just being present is the biggest, and, and it takes learning, but it's. Oh. Well, I like what you were saying, you know, like just grounding yourself like with some of the details and that's sort of forcing you into the present um, and, you know, like noting what is in your environment actually grounds you to the present. It's Because people say, oh, you, you know, in every sphere of life, people are saying, well, you need to be present. And it's like, but there's no real sort of just actionable stuff there. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's just this kind of this nebulous idea. I think like, like your idea of just uh, like noting what's around you is probably a really good technique for that. Um, that's awesome yeah. there's one other one um, which I've used a lot of which is just breathing and again before I was talking about um, I use Luke's breathe up technique but in general just if I'm doing a long swim or just cruising around and I'm I'm quite worked up and I feel I'm worked up I'll actually take you know deep breaths into my stomach um, mm. and I'll double and this is something I, I think I watched on a free diving video um and double the length of the exhale, if that makes sense. So I'll breathe in for four seconds and then really slowly breathe out for eight seconds. Yeah. That's, that's a really, really quick way to lower your heart rate, and it will take uh, uh, like a feeling of panic or I get quite clammy feeling in the water if I get worked up. It gets rid of that feeling almost instantly. Um, mm. I don't use that for breathe-ups, but if I'm feeling overwhelmed or just, worked up I'll, I'll start doing that sort of breathing and quite often now if we're going out to the islands i'll start doing it on the boat when we're about 10 minutes away from the island and mm. it just gets you into a nice relaxed state before you get in the water yep yep yeah i kind of do i kind of do the same um but i do it on the way out just to i always sort of it as sort of pre- prepping your lungs but it's also <clears throat> sort of getting your body ready for this response and then I, I, but I think it's also grounding as well in the fact that you're making yourself present in the moment. You're thinking about what you're going to be doing in half an hour's time, and and uh, all those things are good. Um, yeah, magic, man. Uh, you've made me think a lot about of a lot of internal processes today that I uh, haven't. You know, you don't spend a lot of time thinking about them sometimes until there's sort of a reason to. So you've definitely put me put me in my uh, my my headspace thinking about it today. So it's really cool, man. That, that's good. I think you know. Th- when you contacted me, I was like, oh, I'm not qualified for this. But then I thought, actually, if, if you know, even a couple of other people out there are 
having the same battles that I do and can learn some tools or even want to send me a message, I'm more than happy to have a chat and just explain how I've managed to do it for the last year and got like, I've, I'm not amazing, but I've gotten quite a bit better at it and I've ticked off quite a few good species now. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's doable. Nah, it's awesome, Tim, and it's a solid message, man. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I was going to say, I've, I've dived with some phenomenal athletes like 40-metre uh, divers, and uh, I've been out with them, and, and we've been diving dirty, dark water, and I've watched anxiety take over them too, and they go from being a 40-metre 40 40 diver to a 12-metre diver, and uh, it, it, happen, it happens to everyone at some stage, and uh, you know, different, differing degrees of severity, and because you've dealt with it and you're open and honest about it that has made you definitely an authority with 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 being able to deal with it and even experienced guys have probably got uh, a lot to learn from you, you know some of the processes that you've learned to manage it so i can definitely uh i'm definitely stoked to get you on the show to talk about it man oh i appreciate that it's, again it's it's all about i think how you know right well i think people in general just need to be more open about what bothers them <laughs> really it's yeah, yeah. Uh, just one real quick thing i meant to mention was sometimes it's not always a horrendous panic attack it could be something quite simple last um tuesday when i was really struggling i i couldn't figure out what it was there was nothing wrong we're in a nice calm bay and i was sitting there and i actually took the top of my wetsuit off and realized it went away instantly i'd, I'd literally just been sitting there cooking and overheating and yeah. just feeling really awful so and that in me triggers anxiety anyway but Sometimes it's as simple as get out of the water, get your wetsuit off and get some cold water on your face and it'll probably help because mm -hmm. yeah. um, those wetsuits are quite tight. <laughs> Yeah, look, 100%. And I think one of the things we, we always push on on you guys particularly is keep your gear super simple. And for the simple reason that uh, any complication and difficulty that you have to deal with in the water is magnified due to all the other things you're dealing with. And, uh, you know, whether it's your wetsuit or it's an, a, a, a dive knife strap that won't loosen off or whether it's, you know, like it can be something really small. But uh, if you've got a GoPro and a dive watch and uh, three torches and you know you're dealing with all this other other co complication it's just unnecessary and especially when you're starting uh until you've learned to manage you know your anxieties and fears with all the other shit that goes on when you're out in the water so 100 percent uh and and even a small yeah yeah i couldn't agree with you more um start, yeah. start simple and start at your own pace and even if you're diving guys well above your level like i do um just do it at your pace. If you try and keep up with them, which I've also done, that's when things start to fall apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like it's another good reason to go over your gear too, because um, you, your gear is one thing you can control. So, like, if your dive mask is sorted and you know it doesn't fog because you've treated it, if um, if all the straps are in good condition, if your shooting line's all good and your gun's sorted, uh, your fins are comfortable, you've got good booties, uh, suit and gloves. All those things are things that you can manage before you get in the water to make your job easier and stuff like that. So I can uh, 100%. Yeah. Awesome, man. Any parting comments with uh, sort of, you know, this whole sort of topic? Uh, because otherwise we'll move on. I don't think so. I mean, I, I think I've touched on the main points I wanted to. I, I guess I'd just say if you've thought about trying it or you want to try and again, this, there might be, people that are listening that already do spear fishing and they have anxiety and they deal with it, if there's something else that pushes you outside your comfort zone, uh, just do it. Do it in a safe manner at your own pace, but really just go out and do it because I spent 10 years sitting at my desk working and watching movies in my comfort zone, which was kind of at home or with friends. And the, the most I've felt sort of, I guess, alive is the last year when I go and do all these things <laughs> that I, I explain it to people, even my doctor, and she just sits there and looks at me and she's like, I can't believe you do this. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's really healing, and that, that would be my parting comment, I guess. There's a real good book called The Obstacle is the Way, uh, and it's kind of um, it's, it's kind of talking about what, you, what you're talking about. It's by a guy, Ryan Holiday, and uh, it's kind of – he weaves in all of these um, – oh, what is it? It's a – it's a, it's a philosophical book, but basically it's saying, you know, like, you know, where the greatest series of discomfort and challenge are in your life is probably where the most reward is. And so there's definitely something in what you're saying. And, and I, I've, 
I've tried to do that with different areas of my life as well, whether it's public speaking or whatever, but spearfishing is definitely it for a lot of people. And uh, I don't think there's a more rewarding but challenging uh, sort of sport out there. Um, so, cool, man. What's up, Shrek and Turbo? It's Jeremy here from Spearing Magazine. Uh, you guys have been doing such a killer job. I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, all the back issues are now like fully sold out. So if you guys want to get Spearing Magazine, though, we've come up with an international subscription just for you guys. You can get like the digital edition or the print edition. We're going to send that. We're going to ship that to you guys. Just get over to SpearingMagazine.com. Okay, guys, keep doing what you're doing. Jeremy out. God bless America. God bless President Trump. I love you guys. Adreno Spearfishing are today's a proud sponsor of the Noob Spiro podcast. They stock a huge range of equipment that you can find in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and now Perth. That's right, spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range of gear. I encourage you to get along, use the code Noob Spiro, N O O B S P E A R O, and save yourself $20 on every purchase over $200 when you shop online. Hey, we've talked about uh, sort of what's in your dive bag already, but uh, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about a dive watch. So take us there. Oh, okay. So this was something that I've found to be a very sort of important piece of equipment for me at least. And um, I've got a, oh, I can't remember, it's a Mario's Smart Apnea watch, but um, any dive watch where you can uh, monitor your surface intervals, I think is super important. Um, and this would be... Uh, big piece of advice that I'd give new divers, you don't have to buy a hugely expensive watch, just one that does surface intervals. Um, because the to I've found the thing that's really progressed me forward in diving is, is figuring out what my surface interval needs to be to make my dives uh, better. So yeah. I started off just doing, I'd double the time on the surface. So if my dive was 30 seconds, I'd spend a minute on the surface, then go again. Um, okay. And I struggled for months just not being able to get any longer under the water or deeper. And so one day I thought, right, I'm going to try three times the length. And for me, that seems to have been the golden number because that, I guess for someone who's naturally quite highly strung, it just takes me three times my dive length to relax and get back into a good state to have a proper breathe up and go again. Um, I know a lot of people probably stick to the two times or some people might do five times, I don't know. But having that watch... Um, really it's something you can just monitor yourself with and I actually turn mine around now so I can't see it because what I was doing was getting to a depth and looking at my watch and thinking shit I'm deep <laughs> and then you know panicking and going back up but it's just for that surface interval I think that's a piece of kit that I would invest in quite early on. Nice okay yeah I, it, it brings another cool idea to to sort of fruition it's it's um it's what what gets measured sort of gets done you know like and if you measure something then you can see improvements over time and you can correlate data um so yeah it's de and you can look at your profiles and all the rest of it i think looking at your max depth for a day and recording it is uh, also a useful idea because you can slowly see your uh performance improve over time which is not necessarily a bad thing although that shouldn't be the focus of your dive but uh no nah, that's a cool idea man it is, it is cool to monitor it. Like I, I've now started looking at how long my dives were and they're sort of sitting around a minute and it's like in a really safe, comfortable environment, it's like, right, I'm going to try a minute, five seconds. And I know I've got someone above me, so it's fine. Um, yeah. And that, that's how you progress. And you, ha you, know, you have to push yourself a little bit to get better at it. Um, yeah. And I went from starting and saying to myself, I'm never going below five metres. You know, that, that's totally comfortable for me. That'll be fine. And uh, I've just recently done 18 metres, which is definitely my limit. Um, and it's not okay. something I'd do over and over. I'd never do it over and over again, but I wanted to try it. It felt good, and I had someone spotting me, and it worked. And it was it was nice to actually have the watch at the end of the day to say, right now my max depth is eighteen point four meters or whatever it is. So next yeah, time yeah. I feel the need, I can try it try it again and see if I can better it. Yeah, cool. As long as it doesn't become a point of comparison or like you have to beat it every time, I think it's it's a good number to keep track of because uh, you, you want to see that slow and steady progression. It's definitely not a goal or a target. It's more of a record that. I've got for if I want to try it in training or 
whatever, or the occasion mm-hmm. arrives where there's a deep weed line or something, I know I could do it, but do it, you know, under safe and, uh, in a safe environment. All right, man. Hey, last part of the show, Spiro Q&A. Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? Ooh. Um, for me, it's just... He's pulling up his notes here. <laughs> for me, it's given me the confidence to know what I can do mentally and physically. Um, and that I can push far beyond what for the last 30 years I thought I could do, and that's it. Nice. All right, what's the single best piece of advice you've been given for spearfishing? Uh, what I said at the start, which was to just slow down and, and dive within your limits and just take your time. All right, cool. Who's been the most influential people in your spearfishing? Uh, definitely my friends. They're, they've influenced me a lot and helped me a lot. So name and shame? <laughs> uh, well, the people I seem to spend all my time diving with are, Blair, who you know, and my friend Hayden and my other friend William. Um, and just through them, I've met other people and through the groups. And they're, they're, they'd be loose friends, but they've all just been so helpful. But uh, me, Blair and Hayden seem to spend a lot of time on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. If you could go back in time to when you were just starting out, uh, what what advice would you give yourself? Uh, stop overthinking it. Just take it as it comes and, um, yeah, you'd you don't have to plan every detail of every trip. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, current, What current challenges are you facing in your spearfishing and how are you approaching them? Pretty much what we've just discussed, really. It's the, the spearfishing itself, I feel, coming along nicely. It's just the internal stuff that, again, it gets better off every trip. Um, it doesn't affect me on every trip now, whereas it used to. So it's just, it's just progressing with uh, verbalizing what I struggle with and, and dealing with it and taking its power away. Awesome. Last question, man. Uh, dream spearfishing destination. At the moment, I really want to go up to the Three Kings, which is like off the northern tip of New Zealand. Um, yeah. And it, I watched a Hunters Club episode a couple of weeks ago, which is a show wow. here in New Zealand. And they went up there yes. and they were shooting, you know, 40 kg kingfish. So that's high on my wow. list. And then Rar- next would be Rarotonga. That Hunters Club's a phenomenal channel. That's uh, Sam Wilds in there, isn't he? Uh, it is, yeah. And he... He does a lot of filming for it, and it's it's a brilliant it, it's a brilliant production. Um, they've yeah, done yeah. so well with all the editing yeah. and stuff like that. Love love the commentary. Might have to try and get those boys on one day. Um, all right, and uh, I know you wanted to go the deep the deep free diving week over in uh, Bali. Yeah, that's definitely on my to do list for next April. I'm hoping to go and do the deep week. I, I talked to him about going this year, but work commitments didn't allow that. Um, but Next year, I'd, I'd really like, to, more so just to have a holiday, but to, to do some training with those guys would be pretty amazing. So can you describe what Deep Week is, is, is for, the, for everyone else? It's, it's, it's a long weekend in a little fishing town called Ahmed in Bali. Um, if you Google Deep Week or look them up on Facebook, it's got all the information. It's basically a bunch of really experienced freedivers, sort of the top in their fields, and they take a bunch of people over there and you do – you just train for a few days. It's broken up into you do physical training, so like gym training, you do breath work, I think you do yoga, um, you do obviously the in the water stuff. Um, I think there's a lot of socializing time. You obviously meet a whole lot of people with similar interests, and then yeah. there's the opportunity to do you can go and swim with whales or, or on shipwrecks, or I think you can do like spearfishing. It, it just seems like a pretty epic week for someone who's into spearfishing. <laughs> Um, and I think yeah. I think you'd get a lot out of it. I think it's yeah, like Adam Adam Stern. He's a he's a quirky uh, dude, and I think it is. He's got this perva- from the videos I've seen. It looks like this pervasive sort of fun semi hippie freediver atmosphere, but it looks like a hell of a lot of fun. And you'd learn a shitload and meet a whole lot of cool people. So I'm I'm interested in doing it myself. But there's always too much to do and not enough time to do it, Tim. Exactly. <laughs> hey man, awesome chatting with you today. Um, I, I know you guys have got you, you've got a bit of an idea cooking up with a couple of the lads over there. Um, did you want to talk a bit about it? I won't go too far into it because we're actually myself, Blair, Hayden, and our other friend Tim have started working on a project um, that kind of combines all our passions for spearfishing and my passion for design and into a project that's going to give back to the organisations and the people that support spearfishing and the environment we do it in and, and the people that do it, so touching on mental health and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, I won't say anything more than that now, but I reckon the four of us jump on a conversation with you in six, six months' time and 
we can um, have a pretty good chat about what we've been doing and where we're at. We can have a brouhaha and, and that'll be good. Awesome, man. Hey, where can people come and find you online, Timmy, on Insta? Um, yeah, my Instagram is just Tim Kaverman, which is T I M K A V E R M A W N. Um, okay. And that's where I put most of my spearfishing content. Um, I'm slowly getting into more of the filming. I've just um, priced up a whole underwater um, housing and that for my camera. So creating content I'm quite passionate about. So it's, it's I'm hoping to get some good content and photos and videos and that out there um, as we progress. Cool, man. We'll share them with me, and they'll go up for all the Noob Spiro stuff. And uh, what a what a what a great chat today, Tim. I thoroughly enjoyed myself, and I, I it made me think about a lot of shit. So it was really cool. No, I appreciate you having me, and and um, I appreciate what you do because, like I said to you before, I've listened to every one of your podcasts within the first <laughs> month of diving, and I learned something <laughs> with them. Um, so it was it was brilliant. <laughs> ah, cool, man. I'm glad you got a, got a lot out of it, and uh, yeah, it's great. We've got this, you know, we're meeting more and more divers now that have, you know, sort of, um, you know, they've started out using our podcast a lot, and so they already feel like they know us, and then they're ready to come on the show. So it's it's really cool, man. It comes full circle. No, it's it's awesome, and I like I say, it's even for me to be able to talk about what we've just talked about in a, a reasonably public public forum it's something i've never done but it means a lot to me to be able to have that opportunity so like i say i appreciate it awesome cool tim well thanks for joining me brilliant mate see ya huge episode today with absolutely practical takeaways for everyone uh, dealing with anxiety it's huge and uh, i got one of the biggest things i got out of today was not to fight it just to accept it and to go along with it instead of trying to you know butt heads with it and uh, i think that's that's a that's a big one because if you try and come up against it with brute force it just never seems to work you end up just you know call, calling it quits and and that's your day over and i think all of us have experienced anxiety at, at some stage and i think that today's episode is transferable not just from spearfishing but across all of life so it's absolutely fantastic loved how candid and open tim was had an absolute ball chat with him and bringing episode 99 to you today which brings me to the next point episode 100 just around the corner i've got a couple of ideas i actually wanted to reach out and just do a listener episode just um call you guys up and just to have a five minute yarn and maybe get a story from you and let you pump us for questions um that, that'd be that'd be great so if you're interested in that email me shrek at noobspiro.com episode 100 right around the corner let's focus on the listeners for this one uh as usual guys your love is appreciated when you listen to the podcast leave a review absolutely fantastic if you are more serious about supporting the show come and join us at patreon.com and join the seven other patrons there helping to power the new Spiro podcast all right guys i'm out shrek done today's new Spiro podcast is powered by patrons listener legends just like you who jump on patreon.com forward slash noob Spiro and support the show for every episode produced you get billed there's three different levels you can support us at at two dollars per episode we have the fins now these guys are propelling the new Spiro podcast these guys get early access to content and of course their guest recommendations are prioritized next it's the dive knives five bucks the utility team essential for every Spiro and especially for the new Spiro podcast these guys get early access to content just like the fins do but they're going to get finished products sent to them before anyone else and so get in become a dive knife support the new spiro patreon.com forward slash new spiro for the for the grandiose level of 10 we've got the guns these are our prey takers now for 10 bucks an episode you can get an advert free new spiro podcast to download and also you get all the benefits of all the other levels so jump on support us patreon.com forward slash new spiro it's in today's show notes thanks guys